What's up, gangsters? It is a cold, gray Sunday afternoon, and my beloved Dallas Cowboys are terrible this year, so I'm not watching football right now. So, of course, that's when I decide to make videos. <laughs> so you should all hope for uh, the Cowboys to have a better season, because, you know, that means you put up with me less. At any rate, uh, so uh, this video is going to be really kind of aimed at a very small percentage of an already very small percentage. <laughs> uh, so basically five of you guys will, will want to watch this. Um, there's a few guys in Scale Modeler's Critique Group who are getting into using Fusion 360 to create their own parts so that they can be 3D printed. and. That's kind of, you know, getting a little bit more momentum. We've got like maybe 10 guys doing it now as opposed to five a year ago. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's no shortage of really good resources on YouTube and on the Internet in general for learning how to use Fusion 360. Uh, so I'm not trying to be a, a, a Fusion 360 instructor. There's plenty of people way better at that than I am. But... What I wanted to do was give it to you in context and show you the process of using Fusion 360 to create an actual part that goes in an aircraft kit so that you can kind of relate all of that to you know, what we're doing maybe a little bit better. So let's get right into it. Okay, so here we go. This process starts out in pretty predictable fashion. And I think we've all experienced that, and that is that feeling of disgust <laughs> when you take a look at a kit part. And this is a pretty good example right here. Uh, whoops, we don't need quite that much magnification. How about just one-to-one? -one? All right, so this is the uh, cockpit of the Hasegawa 132nd P40N, and... This is one of two seats that they give you. Uh, the fact is that uh, after the Dash 5 block of production, they had a different seat. Uh, but this one, to me, is more interesting. It's cooler looking and pretty easy to imagine, especially if you're doing a bird from the China-Burma-India theater, where the living was hard and the spare parts were few that they might have been using this particular seat, even in an in model. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but it is pretty unsatisfactory, and you'll see why here in a second. All right, let's take a look at what the real thing uh, looks like. So I'm going to jump over here. Uh, I'm in uh, Lightroom, obviously. Uh, this was a pretty good way to show you guys these photos and some of the ways that I use Lightroom. So I'm going to jump over here to my miscellaneous reference photos catalog that has all kinds of images in it, uh, about 6,200 of them. Uh, and uh, I have a collection here of Warhawk images, P40. All right. Now, still don't want to go through 352 of those, so I have them filtered where I've put a blue label uh, or a blue tag, whatever you want to call it, like this on all of my cockpit images. So I'll filter just for those that are labeled blue. And now you can see that I've got only 36 cockpit images. And you can immediately see that I've got some really nice photos of the seat in question. And this one's probably the best one. You can see, <coughs> you can see, well, that's a pretty small photo. We may have to use four to one. All right, you can see that it is a, uh, it's formed out of sheet aluminum. So super thin, much thinner than you're gonna be able to get with injection molding or even resin or, or 3D printing. But I think we could do better than uh, what we saw with the kit part there that's just extremely thick. So, uh, and we, you know, there's some other features here that are just not going to be possible given any of the, the normal methods other than 3D printing. The uh, uh, photo etch sheet uh, that Edward sells for the interior of this kit 
has a seat that looks pretty good, you know, at first glance, but it has a couple of fundamental problems. You can see that the uh, the seat here has a pretty deep dish to the back of it that flattens out to uh, where it's pretty straight down at the bottom by that gusset and forming that uh, where it looks very realistic in the uh, you know photo etch is going to be kind of hard. The other thing uh, is that uh, on the Edward photo etch, these stiffening uh, ribs that are punched in uh, to the to the real thing, as you can see here, are clearly innies. In other words, the the bump sticks out of the back, and you can see that here. And on the Edward photo etch, they have you uh, forming them with a ballpoint pen from the backside, which means that they're going the wrong direction. So that's a problem. And even if you get them right, even if you had them going in the right direction, getting them to form uh, not only themselves, but to follow this curve here is, is going to be pretty challenging. That's why this kind of thing is done with a gigantic uh, stamping die. The other thing that the real seat has that you're just not going to get in uh, anything that doesn't come from a 3D printed master pattern at least is this rolled edge that you can see around the perimeter of the thing. So there's 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 quite a bit of incentive there to uh, try and create one of my own because at least in theory I can take care of all of that stuff with 3D printing. I won't be able to get it to a scale thickness but I think I can come pretty close. So how do we get from here to a 3D printed part? So, there it is. That is the finished uh, Fusion 360 model of the seat. And you can see that, uh, well, you know, when you look like down here in these, <coughs> oh, excuse me, shouldn't have eaten that uh, chocolate nut covered toffee before filming a video. <laughs> anyway, you can see that I've gotten it relatively thin. Um, and in fact, the actual thickness there is 0.3 millimeters uh, or about 12 thousandths of an inch and uh, you know that's uh, I'm not even gonna bother to do the math as to what that is in you know scale inches but that's about as thin as I can really hope to work with 0 0.2 0 0.3 millimeters that's getting down to the minimum that I can really effectively do with 3D printing. And uh, definitely with the, you know, what's been the state of the art with what they call 2K 3D printers. And I'm talking about resin printers here that uh, use a, uh, what's basically a cell phone screen, an, an LCD um, that's got a resolution that gets the pixels down to around point uh, four, seven, around 47 microns. Uh, and so what that means is that your ability to resolve things in the XY plane, uh, let's say that this seat is getting built in the 3D printer such that this face of the seat is horizontal. All right, that means that curves that have to be resolved in the XY plane, like the, you know, the circumference of this circular feature is going to be made up of a bunch of square pixels that are 0.47 microns uh, on each side. And that's not bad, but the new coming state of the art for these uh, 3D printers is uh, 4K. And that lets you get the resolution of those pixels down to about 35 microns, which is a tremendous improvement. So what I'm talking about is going from something like the Anycubic Photon or Photon S uh, to uh, the new Frozen Sonic Mini. And in fact, the guy who has been doing a lot of my printing has one of those, and we've been testing a little bit. And part of the reason why I even went as, as fine as I did on this wall thickness was because we wanted to really test the capabilities of that machine to produce something like this. So 
That's the end result. Now, the question is, and the point of this video is, how did I get there? So let me uh, take advantage of this feature here with Fusion 360 that allows me to basically rewind the model to the very beginning. The first thing that I have to do is I have to provide myself with something to work off of as a reference because it's pretty difficult to measure the kit part, uh, at least in all of the, the relevant dimensions, and then translate those into a shape. So the much simpler thing that you do is you bring in a, a what's called a canvas. And this is nothing more than a photo that I took at my workbench with my iPhone uh, and then emailed to myself and imported into Fusion 360. And then what you have to do is you have to calibrate it. And that basically uh, just asks you to pick a couple of points on the photo and it will uh, ask you to, uh, let's say I pick this point and this point. Then it lets you dial in the actual dimension. So you take one or two dimensions off of the real part and then that's what you input here, and that sizes the photo to be uh, basically the same as the real life kit part is. And so in this case, what I did is I uh, created uh, a photo, made a photo, whatever, and imported so that I had a view of the kit part from two different directions. Okay, so now that I kind of uh, have an idea of, of how this thing is going to look, and I've got some uh, references, I sort of have to come up with a strategy. Now, I don't want to try and turn this into a complete course in solids modeling using Fusion 360. Uh, we just don't have enough time for that, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not the best teacher anyway. Um, but what I do want to do is give you guys just kind of an overview so what you can see me turning on over here are sketches, all right? And sketches are the basis for pretty much everything that you will ever do in a parametric solids modeling package like Fusion 360, SolidWorks, Pro Engineer, whatever. And um, that's what you see here. What I have basically done is created a series of sketches that define the outer boundaries of this shape. All right, so let me turn off these canvases, get them out of the way, so you can see these a little bit better. All right, and, and, I've, and I've defined all of these sketches on various planes. All right, some of them are the origin planes that every, you know, every, every model starts with. Some of them are reference planes that I've created myself. Um, and and th th these are all really important parts of the strategy in creating a, a model like this. You have to kind of understand the tools. Um, you know, this is, this is really similar in a lot of ways to, you know, being at your workbench and knowing what you want your finished product to look like and understanding that you have paint and glue and knives and saws and paintbrushes and you know how each one of those things works uh, in the process of getting you to that end result. The same thing is true of, of doing CAD modeling. And so I know that while I want this to end up being a, a solid model in the end, that I'm going to need to use some surfacing techniques to get there. And so you can see up here that I have several different modules that I can work in. And surfacing basically just allows me to create uh, some surfaces that represent the basic shape of this thing because uh, with a solid what you're typically doing are boolean operations where you're either carving away from or adding to what amounts to a solid chunk of digital material and when you've got a shape that's really kind of organic like this thing is that becomes very difficult because think about it all right, if I want to drill a hole in, in this thing, it's pretty easy for me to say, okay, I'll just create a round sketch 
and I'll use that as the basis for punching a hole through this. Okay, so, or if I wanted to have a, a round boss sticking out of it, same thing just in reverse. But when you think about it, what tools, you know, what shape of a tool, a cylinder or a rectangle or a hexagon or whatever, am I going to use to carve that shape out of a solid block, right? It's not, you can see pretty quickly that that's not going to be an effective strategy. And so that's why I'm using this uh, strategy of defining basically the perimeter of the entire thing using these uh, various uh, sketches to define where I want the surfaces to start and end. And what I'll do then is, uh, and you can see like this thicken feature down here, what that does is it enables me to take these surfaces and turn them into, so I can go from uh, this, that's the first half of the surface that defines the, uh, the back of the seat, then I've mirrored that, then I've added another surface down there. Again, not going to get into every single bit of this, but you can see that basically I'm just creating these surfaces along the way, and then I start to thicken them. Okay, and that gives me a solid chunk of material. And then once I've got enough of those built up to where I've defined the entire structure of the seat, and this is where I make a critical decision, by the way, and that is, what do I want that wall thickness to be? And that's where I, I select that 0.3 millimeters as kind of being that basic dimension. And so understanding the process that you're going to use to make these things is super, super important. All right, so what I have now is a bunch of different bodies. And ideally, what you want to end up with is one single body. And the reason is because when you start trying to convert something like this into an STL file or G-code for a CNC mill, you know, that sort of thing, it has a hard time with separate bodies for each thing. And so what I'm ultimately going to be trying to do is go along here in the process and join all of those together. And you can see down here, that's what these little icons represent. And so this body 25 is a single combination of all of the things that I've done before into one continuous solid. And you want to establish that as early as you can in the process so that you can then start to add features to it. And so that's what I'm basically going to do then is to start uh, building things onto it. All right, so um, let's just kind of step through some of these. All right, you can see that what I've done here is I've started to add that rolled edge on there. And that basically is a solids tool called a sweep uh, where I take, a, uh, I take a circle or whatever shape the profile is gonna be. In this case, it's a circle. I establish a plane right there, I sketch a circle on it, and then I use the edge of the seat as the path for that circle to travel along. And you can see that it only made it over to here. And this happens sometimes. You know, this is complicated math. Uh, and so what I had to do was a, an, addition, an additional sweep that got me the other part of that rolled edge. And then uh, I continued working through that and got myself a sweep that defined half of the front. And I had a lot of problems with this, by the way. <laughs> it's part of the reason why, if you look up here, you'll see this is version 78. It took a bunch of tries to get me to where this was successful. Some of this stuff is really trial and error, uh, which is great because it's just digital. You know, you can redo it as many times as you have to. Anyway, once I got that side of that rolled edge defined, then I just mirrored it over to the other side, and now I've got the other thing. So 
This is starting to look a lot like the finished form of the thing. But as you can see with this number of features down here, obviously I was not close to done. Uh, this thing was probably about 20 hours total work. And I'm, you know, I don't know if that was fast or slow. I mean, it is what it is. It takes, takes the amount of time that it takes. Um, there are definitely people who are better at, at, at Fusion 360 than I am who could have done this uh, probably a lot faster. But uh, uh, I am still, you know, kind of on the learning curve myself. And um, even though I have a lot of CAD experience, each package is different. And some of these things that I'm doing, uh, I haven't done in like 20 years since my engineering days where I was driving uh, pro engineer all the time. Anyhow, the next thing I've got to do is create all these ribs, and that is a bunch of features. And the, uh, the way that you do it is pretty tedious. What I basically had to do was create a sketch uh, to define each one of these profiles and then project that onto this surface right here and then use that to split the surface so that this little area in here was kind of its own thing because what I'm going to want to do with, with each one of those is use them at, to punch out a depression. So you can see now that I've got all those on there. And uh, once those are embossed, and, and <laughs> Fusion 360, yeah, it's frustrating. They have been making a big deal of how they improved the emboss feature because it lets you do something like uh, press uh, or extend like some text. Like imagine the text on the sidewall of a tire. In theory, you can use the emboss or deboss command to do that, and you'd think I could use the same thing to do these. Yeah, no, because it only works on cylindrical surfaces, and this definitely uh, is not one of those. But you can see that I had to go through a bunch of steps to get all of these ribs defined, and uh, I use my mirror command whenever I can, um, but I got them all, all stamped in there, and you see I get all the way up to here, and this now has the basic structure of the seat, all of those ribs with their basic structure. And now I'm getting into what I call sort of refining features. Okay, now before I get into those refining features, let me take a pause here for a second and show you exactly how these sketches work. Because I, I, I feel like I keep mentioning it and... Uh, but I'm not really explaining what that actually entails. All right, but like for these um, for these ribs that I've been punching, uh, let me see if I can find them. Part of the challenge with a model like this is that you uh, get a bunch of features, and every one of them has a sketch and finding the one that represents a specific feature can be challenging. There we go. So these are all the sketches that I used to create these places that are, are embossed into the back surface of the, or the front surface of the seat back. So you can see they're on a plane way over here and it's actually oriented such that it's at the same angle. This is about a four degree angle, this line right here. And so I created a plane that's got uh, that same orientation and that's where all of these get projected from. And this is also one of the challenges of doing anything in CAD is figuring out how to set up your references so that the geometry you're looking to create uh, comes out the way that you want it to. But let me just show you specifically uh, how a sketch operates. So let's say that I've decided that I do in fact want to put a hole in the bottom of this seat, all right? So I go right here and I tell Fusion that I'm going to create a sketch. Now it wants a surface for me to put that sketch on. That can be a plane, it can be any flat surface, uh, you know, anywhere. So I'm going to just go ahead and pick the bottom of the seat, 
All right, and now it flips around to where I'm looking at that from straight overhead. So let's say that I just need a round hole. So I'm going to hit C for circle, and I can put this anywhere, okay? And it can be any size. But I'm going to, let's say I want to define that to be exactly 3 millimeters. So I select 3, and I hit Enter. All right, now I've got a 3 millimeter circle. But you'll notice that it's blue. All right, that means it's undefined. And what that means is that it's unconstrained. So I can move it around. I can do anything I want to with it. And you might think that's good. But the problem is that if these parametric solids modeling packages, they like for their math to be perfectly defined. And if I modify this thing later, all right, let's say that I want this circle to always be in the center, okay? And let's say that I just scoot it where it's about, looks like it's about right. Well, if I modify the width, overall width of this seat later, well, this is not going to travel with all the other features, and it's going to end up being somewhere off to one side. So I need to define this feature, and I'm going to tell it by hitting D for dimension that I want to put it a certain distance away from the center datum of the seat. Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, zero doesn't work, right? I could say that it needs to be exactly one inch, I mean one millimeter, whatever it is. Okay, now you can see that that's defined. And it'll always reside at that point. No matter what I do to the rest of the geometry, it's going to always reside one millimeter away from the center line of the thing. But let's say that I actually want it to, okay, let me, uh, let me give it another dimension because you can see it's still blue. So now let's say that I want it to always be two millimeters away from that edge right there. Now you can see that the sketch has turned black. And that means that it's totally defined and it's always going to have that dimensional relationship to the rest of the, of the thing. All right? But let's say I don't like it, this one millimeter dimension is not really good. So let's get rid of that and let's use a constraint. These things up here are all really handy because they allow me to define uh, geometric constraints like vertical and horizontal. So I can tell it by using that one that I want the center of the seat in this sketch to always be vertical, directly below in other words, the center point of the, of, of the origin, which I've intentionally defined as being the middle of the seat. So now you can see that symbol right there means that I've got that constraint in place. So no matter what I do, this hole is always going to be in the middle of the seat pan. All right, so what do I do with that sketch? All right, I've finished the sketch, and now, okay, I will turn that into a feature by going over here to extrude. That's one of a number of features that I could use, uh, I, could, I could create using that sketch. Okay, so I select that sketch profile, and now I can go either way with it. I can extrude it out as a solid, or I can make it go this way and be a cut. And you can see over here what type of feature it is. And this is where you get into, you know, whether you create a cut, a join, a new body, whatever. But I want that to be a cut. So I say OK. And now, bam, I've got a round hole in the bottom of the seat. So that's how sketches work. And they are the fundamental kind of thing with doing solids modeling. And you have to get good at, at understanding and defining sketches if you want to get good at solids modeling. Now, I obviously don't need that hole in the bottom of the seat, so I'm going to get rid of it. All right, now, um, let me talk a little bit about what I did to finish this thing out and uh, wrap this up. All right, all of these ribs have uh, a rounded edge to them because they're punched in sheet metal, and that's never going to have a perfectly square edge. So I want it to look realistic, and so what I've done is I've, I've put a fillet on every one of these edges. And Fusion makes that pretty easy for you to do. You just pick the fillet feature up here, and then pick the edges that you want, define the radius that you want, and then boom, you've got those rounded edges. 
But what I, I, I want to emphasize, this is an age-old CAD lesson, is that you've got two different kinds of, of radii. You've got what I call um, design radii, and then you've got uh, what are more like uh, feature uh, or, or manufacturing or detail radii. All right, so the radius of the top of the seat here, this big curve, uh, that's a design radius. That's part of the, of the shape of the thing. All right, the radius right here at the corner of this uh, rolled edge, that's a design radii. All right, that defines the shape of the thing. All of these, though, these are detail radii. And with any part, whether it's injection molded or investment cast or sheet metal or whatever, can have a whole bunch of detail radii. And you can see all these right here. And I encourage you, if you get into this, save those till as late in the process as possible because they are computationally intense. And you want to get as much of your model done and saved and locked in before you start doing uh, all of these detail radii because you'll run into situations where they won't want to compute. And you may have to, you know, you may have to do some gyrations. Uh, it's just one of those things. Everybody who's done much CAD work knows what I'm talking about. It can turn into uh, a real puzzle. Um, and as I... <laughs> As I said to somebody, uh, to, to the to guys in the SMCG uh, yesterday when I was posting some pictures of CAD, is you can kind of think of, of CAD as a really, really slow video game. And it's totally true. Um, and in the case of doing it, you know, for creating uh, uh, parts for our models, you know, the reward is you get more stuff to paint. <laughs> but it's worth it because you get exactly what you want, or at least uh, close to it. Anyway... Uh, you can see that I'm almost done here, but what I don't have are all the rivets. And this is where you can really start going down the rabbit hole. Because rivets, obviously, you know, they can number in the hundreds or thousands. And getting them made properly can become pretty computationally intense because you have to create. I mean, it's pretty easy in some cases, all right? Like right here, all right? These rivets are on a flat face. No big deal. Do a sketch on a plane of one rivet and then create a rectangular pattern that just runs across there. These rivets up here, on the other hand, are more difficult because I have to project a line onto this surface that represents a curved path for that pattern to run along. And then you have to define how you want the rivets to be oriented relative to the surface. It, it, gets, it can get pretty gnarly. But, again, if you really want that highest level of detail, you know, these are the kind of finishing touches that will set your uh, finished model apart uh, from something that looks crude. And this is also the point where you really have to keep in mind uh, what your manufacturing capability is. All right, like these rivets are something like 0.2 uh, millimeters in diameter and 0.1 millimeter thick. And I purposely did them that small knowing that that's really too small for a 2K 3D uh, printer. But I wanted to see if they would come out better uh, for, uh, on, a, on a 4K printer. And in fact, they did. They work pretty good. And I will show you uh, some pictures here at the end of what that finished product looked like. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this uh, trick as a way to sort of summarize all this because I know I glossed over a lot of things. So I'm going to use the uh, feature that lets Fusion 360 play through the entire model. And I'll just kind of call out each thing as it happens. Okay, so there were my uh, canvases. Now I'm building my uh, surfaces with all of my sketches to define each thing. Then I'm thickening them, all right? So that's each surface thickened and then joined, all right? Now I'm defining and sweeping the rolled edge, taking care of that same thing on the front of the seat bucket there. That took a lot of steps. 
All right, that's the cross brace, punching the cutouts in that, defining the sketches for each one of these stiffening ribs to emboss those features. I had to do uh, each one of those individually. A um, couple of details there. Now that's defining the sketches for the stiffeners on the side of the seat. And I did. I only had to do that on one side because then I was able to mirror them over to the opposite side. All right. Same thing with those. I did those uh, stiffeners in three different sets. Now I'm starting to add some rivets to detail things out. And here we come with all of those detail radii on all of those embossed stiffeners. And a few more little things that I had to do to make sure that the thing fit with the kit parts. That's always good. And now adding the final bit of rivets. And there you go. Okay, even better than showing you photographs of the 3D printed part, let me just show you the real thing, because I got a whole stack of them right here. So let's just take a quick look at how it turned out. This is not even uh, what I think is maybe the best sample, but it's pretty close to it. So you can see, first of all, now you, you can see the reality of just how tiny and how thin the walls are on that thing. That's what 0.3 millimeters or 12 thousandths of an inch looks like in real life 3D printed. And you can see what I was saying about those rivets being almost too small. Let's see if the camera will focus. You can just barely see them on there kind of have to only kind of kind of can only see them when I get the angle exactly right and so you might be wondering if it was even worth doing and that's not an unfair question but this is kind of part of the process is figuring out what is worth doing based on what the capability of the machine is uh, and how much time it takes to do it in CAD because the riveting riveting in CAD takes a, a while and if they don't really show up you know if they won't if they won't hold paint or a wash or, or whatever when you're you know when you're done uh, is it you know is it really worth doing I, again the jury's kind of still out on these I can see them better in real life than you can probably see them in camera um, that angle right there might show them a little bit better. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, that's the deal. That's, that's, that's what all of that work was for. And again, uh, let's see, where is it? Somewhere here on my bench. Oh, there's the original kit part. So... It's that versus that. I mean, to me, that's just a no-brainer. I feel very happy with my return on investment for time and effort. Okay, so there you go. If you suffered through all that, I hope you found it instructional. And, and, and I hope that you have a little bit better insight of exactly what it, you can do uh, using Fusion 360 to create uh, s custom parts for your models. Um, it's not as hard as it looks, but then again, I'm also saying that from the perspective of somebody with, you know, many thousands of hours of, of CAD practice over the years. But you don't have to have many thousands of hours to be able to do what I just showed you. Um, you just have to spend a little bit of time, learn the basics, and then kind of build on that. And, and you'll find that you can create more and more complicated things. Uh, but if you're interested in getting into 3D printing, it really is an essential skill because your digital database has to come from someplace and what better source than your own mind because only you know exactly what you really want for your model. So at any rate, uh, there you go. Uh, as always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.